Hallelujah. How many are ready for the word of God today? Isaiah chapter 43 from verse 18 to 19. It says, did not remember the former things or ponder the things of the past. Listen carefully, I'm about to do a new thing. Other translation says, do you perceive it? How many believe that God can do a new thing? God can do something new in our life. And I think for us, it's very important not just to, to ask God for new things, but to ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes. There are a lot of things that we are not aware of simply because we cannot perceive it. And, and the Bible is clear about this. And, and, and this, and this, and this book, in this text, I say the prophet is, is telling the, the, the nation, do not, for, do, not, um, do not remember the former things. Because sometimes the things, both the, the failures of the past and even our past victories, can hinder us from experiencing something new. And I think it's very important to perceive in the kingdom of God, or in, in, as you walk with the Holy Spirit, your perception determines how you receive from him. So the question is whether not that God is doing something new, the question is can you perceive it? Can you receive it? Oftentimes we come to church every Sunday, every weekend, we, we are in the presence of God and, and for most of us we, we, we come and we sing songs, we, we worship God, but for, 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 there's some of us that probably you're here but you're not perceiving. I think the perception of the presence of God also kind of determines the level of our worship, the level of our reverence that, that we are in awe of God, so it's important to perceive. I'm just reminded that the enemy, he kind of operates. He doesn't have power. He has been defeated. Amen. You believe that? But he operates in darkness. And in scripture, darkness means ignorance. So the enemy has power over what you do not know. And a lot of us, we, we kind of settle for our walk with God of just going to church. But there are things that we are not familiar of or we do not know. And the enemy wants that for you to be ignorant. Because as long as you're ignorant, there are things about the blood of Jesus that has accomplished that if you do not perceive it, it's kind of dangerous. I remember Jacob when he was running away in, in Genesis 28 and, and the time when he encountered God for, for the first time, he received a vision when he slept and, and he used a rock as a pillow and, and after he woke up, he just had an encounter. He was already in the same place. Same place, but then he said, God is here, the presence of God is here and I was not aware of it. I think one of the most challenging things or, 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 or sad things that can happen to us is when we're already that close in proximity with the Holy Spirit, but then we don't perceive. That we become over familiar with his presence, that, 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 that we think we are still in relationship with God, but we no longer have the fellowship. We no longer have that communion. And so it's important to perceive things. I also remember the, the Shunammite woman who opened her home to the prophet to the man of God, and I think that the man of God has been coming to her house for quite some time, sharing a meal together, but then the Bible says, now I perceive that this man is a man of God. So the moment she perceived, her actions began to change. Her, her behavior began to change. Her treatment began to change. So instead of just settling for a meal, she opened her home, and she began to make room for the man of God so that the man of God could rest. Not just come in, eat for a meal, and then go home. Sometimes we settle for a quick meal with the Holy Spirit because we don't perceive. I remember Abraham in Genesis 12, uh, Genesis 13 and 14, uh, the previous chapter, God already spoke to him a promise. And if you read Genesis, and, and, and Abraham received promise from, for, for, for inheritance, for land, and also for, 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 for descendants. And, and God gave a promise to Abraham. And he told Abraham to leave his place and go to a land that God will show him. And, and, and he brought with him Sarah and he brought with him Lot. And, and they, they were together in the journey. And as they take steps of obedience, God began to bless them. But in verse 14, if I may read in Genesis 13, they had to separate together. Abraham had to separate with Lot. 
God told him that I'm going to bring you to a land. I'm going to give a promise to you. And part of that promise is not just descendants, but land. Are you here? And Abraham brought with them a lot. And, and, and they had to separate because of conflict with their, with their servants. And in verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Abram after Lot had left him. Listen to this. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had left him. Now lift up your eyes. And look from the place where you are standing. I love it because it's this after Lot had left him, probably Abraham was his head down. He was kind of sad that he had to separate from his, from his nephew Lot. He, 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 I don't know what he was feeling, but sometimes when God begins to allow separation to happen to us, we begin to feel discouraged. We begin to feel like oh, we're losing some people. But, but it, it says here, after Lot had left Abram, God spoke again. And God said, now lift up your eyes. Remember the land that I was telling you? He did not even realize he was standing on the promise that God has given him, but he was not able to perceive it until Lot left him. His family, one of the names of Lot means veil. I wonder that if there are things that we've been praying for, we're not even aware, we're already standing on that promise because we're not perceiving it right. Are you here today? My prayer for you today is that God would open up your eyes and you begin to cry out, God, I want to see and perceive right. I want fresh eyes. And today I want to speak a message I'm calling fresh eyes. Tell your neighbor, say fresh eyes. John chapter 9, and starting from verse 1. It says here, as he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he went, say, say this, say, he went and washed, came back seeing. He went, he washed, he came back seeing. I don't know how you came to this house today and to this church but my prayer is that as you came here, you may come here with struggles. You may be coming here with, 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 with some, some discouragement. You'll be coming here with some worries and anxiety. My prayer is that you will go back not the same way that you came in, just like this blind man who, who went, who washed, and he came back seeing. That's what one encounter with Jesus can do in your life. It can transform your life and change the trajectory of your life. Because for this blind man, he was blind from birth. He went, he washed, and he came back seeing. Mark chapter 8, if you can open your Bibles there, in verse 22, another blind man, another story. It says, and they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes, there's another spit again, laid his hands on him, and he asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Today, I want to speak this message because I feel like God wants to do something new, but not until your eyes, is, your vision is restored. Not until your perception takes place, then you can receive right. So I, I want to call some of my, my friends... Uh, Andre and, and Theo, if I, if, are they here? They're going to help me preach. Can you give them a round of applause? Okay. Are you guys ready? So if you can stay in one, one side, yeah, put, put blindfolds on. John chapter 9, we, we read about the story about a man blind from birth. So that means he was blind from birth. He never got to see anything. He didn't see the beautiful mountains, beautiful creation, never got to see beautiful faces because he was blind from birth. 
And it's important to understand that you're, you may have eyes to see today, but when you lack vision, it's quite difficult because you, get, you don't have any direction. And the Bible says that without vision, people perish. Without vision, people cast off restraint, meaning without vision, there is no standard. Without vision, there are no boundaries, no parameters. Without vision, vision is when, when vision comes into your life, not only that it paints a picture of your future or destiny, it also begins to set up a, the guidelines in which how you need to live. So when we, we, when we don't have vision, we can't perceive it. And whatever, whatever it is, whatever blessing, whatever great food in the sight of a blind man, it's still not working. Are you here? So many times we get to be frustrated at God because we feel like there's nothing happening with our lives. It's not that God is dead nor God is absent or not, God is not there. It's just that we are not perceiving it right. My question is, do you have eyes to see what God is doing in your life today? So in John chapter 9, as they passed by this blind man, his disciples were with Jesus and they began to ask the question, why is this man blind? Was it his sin or the sin of his parents? Kind of their question was rooted from a religiosity culture of, of the, the reason why this is happening because probably he did something wrong. And sometimes it's also rooted in our own Filipino culture that if things are happening that's bad, probably you did something, something wrong or terrible. And I love the response of Jesus because he kind of pointed them to the right direction. There was blaming. They were looking for somebody to take the blame. Is it because of him or his parents? But then I love it that before Jesus opened the blind man's eyes, I think that he was about to open the blindness of the disciples that they were with Jesus, but they were still missing the point. You could be with Jesus, but still miss the point. In fact, there was one disciple that was with him for three years and still missed the point. Everybody transitioned from calling him rabbi to Lord and still he missed the point. Are you here? So Jesus said, it's not, that's, that's not what's important today. What's important is that there is a present need and somebody needs to get a touch from heaven in this place. So Jesus began to, to do something weird for us. But it's not the only time. This is not Jesus' healing technique. It's, I believe he healed many sick people already in the gospel, says you read. The one word is enough to heal, are you here? To a point that a, a centurion was even observing Jesus and how he was healing the sick. And, and, and when he came to Jesus, he said, all right, let's go to your house and heal. And, and the centurion said, no, 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 Jesus, I've seen how this works. Just say a word. Just say a word. The entire universe was framed by the spoken word of God. Just say a word. You don't need to come. Just release that word. All I need is a word and I believe. There's healing, there's miracle. And the same way the leper that was touched by Jesus as well or, 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 or the, was also touched not just by a word, but Jesus is powerful enough by the authority to heal just with one word, but then sometimes he teaches us some principles. Are you here? And I love that Jesus began before he, 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 he spat on the ground, he began to make mud, and, and probably that's weird for you to see and and it's kind of yucky. Are you here? But it reminds me with one thing. I think Jesus brought us back to the original design. You see, there's a principle we need to understand. And one, one of the principles in creation is that where you come from is your life source. Where you come from is your life source. To illustrate further, there's a difference with the word create and the word make. They're two different words. To create something means to take something out of nothing and that nothing should produce something out of it. Are you here? And to make something means to take from one substance, turn it into another. But that's why when, when we begin to make mango shakes, we need mangoes. Are you here? When you, you, you go, go, go to coffee shops, you need coffee beans and they will make you one, right? But to create something means to take out of nothing and the Bible says, and the Bible says that when God spoke, nothing had to give birth to something. God created the heavens and the earth. You believe that? 
And this is what I want you to understand. When God created the earth, everything necessary to make other things was already there in the ground when God made it that all he needed to do was speak to what contained it and what contained it has to let loose of what is inside of it. So when God wanted to make trees, he spoke to the ground. He says, let the ground bring forth the fruit bearing trees and the ground bring forth the trees. And how do I know it's life source because God spoke to what contained it and what contained it is where it came from and where it came from is its life source. How do you know that? It's when we separate the tree from the ground, the tree dies. Separate the plant from the ground, the plant dies. Are you here? You separate the fish from the water, the fish begins to die. God wanted to make man. He spoke to himself. He says, let us make man in our own image. So that means though your body was made from the dust and from the ground, but your spirit came from the presence of God. And that's the reason why the wages of sin is death. Why? Sin is missing the mark and it brings separation. And it means when sin entered the world, are you still with me? When sin entered the world death took place why because just a tree is separated from the ground and the fish separate from the water a person separated from the presence of God there is no life though you there's no life source that's why we need God are we here our body came from the ground therefore we need to eat food but your spirit who you are is in need of its original environment, the presence of God. Are you following me? So here comes a blind man from John chapter 9, represented by Theo. The blind man from John chapter 9 was blind from birth. Now it's different when we read about Jesus giving back health to people, giving back their their lives, giving back their hope, Given, given back their wholeness. We read about this story and, and many times people, like the woman bleeding for 12 years, there, there's years attached to the detail of the text. And, and we read about this story in John 9, the man was blind from birth. He had no experience about sight. He never got to receive this from his entire life. And what I love about Jesus is that he began to to show us and to teach us to bring back the original heart and the original design of God. Before before Genesis chapter 3, I'm sorry, before the fall, that was the perfect design. And what I love about the story is that Jesus began to spit on the ground and from the ground he began to make mud. And what I love about this is this, the person may be born blind from birth, but Jesus, the moment he knelt down, he began to communicate and he began to say that according to my original blueprint, you're not supposed to be blind, you're supposed to see. According to my original blueprint, you're not supposed to be walking in that depression, you're supposed to have peace, you're supposed to have wholeness, you're supposed to be healed. According to my original no blueprint sometimes when we challenge people to change it's not really becoming somebody new sometimes it's going back to the original design to go back to the original design and intent of God and that's what the enemy is trying to destroy or distort in our culture today so we read about Jesus he began to make mud out of the ground with his saliva what's in saliva it's yucky Can you imagine that during COVID, Jesus would spit and everybody would run away from Jesus, put alcohol all over Jesus. He began to spit. He, what he was doing, he, the ground is the blueprint of the person's body. And what's really in saliva, one of it is DNA putting back his original, his DNA to something ordinary, to something that was just messy. You see, you could be in a messy situation, but when the hand of God is on it, when the spirit of God is on it, when the anointing is on it, something begins to change, something supernatural begins to change. And what I love about the story is though the man was blind from birth, this tells me something, that we cannot limit God by our experience. We cannot limit God by what we are exposed to or we never experience in our lives. But this teaches us that God is able to give you something you never had before. God is about to give you. He can give you. He can bless you with something you never had before. And as 
As what I said earlier in the service, I felt like there are people that's here in the room today. You've been praying for something and your prayer kind of feels you're doubting God because is this prayer okay? Because we never experienced this kind of breakthrough that I'm kind of praying for. We never experienced this kind of favor that we're praying for. My family never experienced this kind of blessing. And somebody, something happens to you when you begin to pray. And I want you to know that God is able to give you something you never had before. If you've got faith in the room believe that say amen. amen we cannot limit God by your experience the problem is sometimes we begin to redefine our theology based on our experience just because you ex never experienced it no my prayers we get to level up our experience with what we're reading my prayers we get to live live and experience what we're reading and that's what happened and, and, and amazingly in, in John chapter 9 we get to see that God is able I feel like there are people praying for prayers for years. You've been believing and you're almost giving up. And you look back to everybody that has come before you in your family. Nobody was able to get out of that poverty. Nobody was able to get out of that broken situation. Nobody was able to, to, to have a healthy marriage. And you might be the first one if you begin to cry out to God. You might be the exception in your family because I believe God can give you something you never had. But the question is, do you perceive God that he can do a new thing? Do you perceive that he can do a new thing? And what I love about the story is that Jesus anointed the man's eyes. Just paint this picture with me because we don't have mud here. And I don't plan to spit on Theo. But it was kind of messy. Because he experienced the touch. But Jesus said, I want you to go to Siloam and take a journey. Can you imagine how messy is that journey? He, he would not see properly. He would probably stumble and, and probably people would be watching him and laugh at him. It's like, look at this guy. What is he doing? He was born blind already. Why are you trying to hope? But what I love about this story is that you can experience a touch. You could encounter glory right there. But then Jesus wants you to journey with him. He says, I want you to go to Siloam. And the problem sometimes is this. We're addicted to the deliverance. We're addicted to that one moment, that instant moment. We, we're addicted to, and nothing's wrong with miracles. And I believe that God is a miracle working God. And he still does miracles. I still believe that today. Amen. But there's a problem when we're just totally dependent on, on, on deliverance to, or for something to happen instantly. But we fail to walk in the process that it requires to sustain what God has already accomplished. We want the miracle. We don't want to walk the journey. We want the instant deliverance. We don't want to walk the discipline that it takes. We don't want to open our lives to other people and be accountable to them. And that's the thing. Jesus touched him, and that was enough. But Jesus released the word. He said, I want you to go wash. And as he went, taking that journey, sometimes there are miracles not in the here and now. It's in the as you go. And sometimes we always demand God, you know, you got to do it this way. you got to do it my way. And until today, until now, it's still you sitting on that throne. I love the story that he took a journey. He was walking towards Siloam, which means sent. And as he was going there, sometimes I don't know the thoughts in his head. Was this working? I don't know the people that was looking or observing him, but listen to me. Sometimes it doesn't matter what people see, what people say, as long as you've got a word that you're anchored in. He said to tell me to go to Siloam and wash. I'm going. And he came back seeing. Is that amazing? He came back seeing. Amen. 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 My prayer is that you came to this service today and you're going to go back with a fresh vision. You came to this service today struggling, but you're going to go back free in the name of Jesus. And then you walk that process. Then you walk that journey with him. You walk that. You begin to say, hey, hey, you begin to ask people that are in the next steps. People want to journey with you. People want to grow with you. People want to disciple you. So sometimes there's a problem. Sometimes when we just want the miracle, we don't want the discipleship. 
We want the miracle, we don't want the discipleship. So it's very important, are you here? Why? Because the, the point of the signs and wonders is to point us to Jesus and stay there and grow. We need to journey together with God. And if you're here today and you're believing God for something and you feel like as you are praying, you feel like, whether is this prayer kind of too big? This prayer kind of like, I'm not sure if this happens, if this is gonna be, gonna be happening or if this is possible because nobody in our family experienced this kind of favor. But God can do a new thing. We cannot limit God based on our experience. Are you here? How many of you are praying for, for God to do something new in your life? Are you believing for something today? Keep believing. Keep believing. Keep walking in faith. And what we read about the, the other scripture, we go to Mark chapter 8. Different blind man. Mark chapter 8 says, as they went to, as they came to Bethsaida, that some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. So the other person, Jesus, encounters him and he commands him to walk. So many people are watching him. Commands him to go to the pool of Siloam and there was people around him. And then another instance in Mark chapter 8, they brought to Jesus a blind man. And what Jesus did, he did kind of something different. Because instead of performing the miracle right at the place where they brought the man, Jesus leads him by the hand outside the village. What is speaking to me is that sometimes we are, we are, we, we just think we're convinced that God can only work when during conferences. That God can only work when everybody's there, when there's a lot of people gathered. But I, I'm here to tell you, all the way from Cebu, to tell you that the same God, that the same spirit, that's the same presence who is doing the great work and amazing gatherings and revival meetings can still be the same God who can work with you in private. The same God that can reveal things to you in your secret place. The same God who can still speak to you when you're alone. So sometimes God doesn't just move in this big place. He he can move in your room, he can move in your house, he can move in your kitchen, he can move in the car while you're in traffic and God can reveal things to you, just you and God. I think the problem is sometimes we just limit God on the spectacular and we reject the simple. We reject the simple but then the same God who is here every Sunday is still there on your Monday, on your Tuesday, on your Wednesday, on your Thursday. And I believe, listen to me, sometimes we think that just in my private time, I'm just, maybe, maybe it's just a little thing that God can do. No, I believe there are great things that can be revealed to you in private before it becomes public. I believe that God can still speak to you just by yourself with the word of God. That he can reveal himself to you privately. And what I love about the story is that as Jesus took the blind man outside of the village, he didn't spit on the ground. He didn't make mud. He just spat directly on. There was no mud required. And the Bible says he touched him and he asked the question, did it work? It's kind of weird to, to hear Jesus ask, confirm, did, 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 did that work? Because I'm just testing some things out. Uh, maybe in, that, in John 9, I, I made some mud. This time there's no mud. Uh, did it work? Did it work? God is not asking if it worked. He's given this person an opportunity to kind of level up his situation. Why? Because when he touched this blind man in Mark 8, and he said, do you see? Did it work? Can you now see? And the blind man said, I can see, but people, I see people walking like trees. And some of us, sometimes we are, because that's what we experience. We sometimes leave and we say, I'm good. Maybe it's not God's will. Maybe I'm okay with trees walking. But hold on. You know what trees are? You know what people are? So meaning you had sight before but lost it. So God cannot, it's not only a God that could give you something you never had. 
God can restore something that you've lost. I don't know what used to work in your life before but lost it. I don't know what that was. And maybe it's not really sight. Maybe you had passion before but lost it. Maybe you had zeal for God before but lost it. Maybe you were serving before, but you lost that. Maybe you were winning people for Jesus before, but you lost it. What was something that was working before, but then you lost it? And sometimes we choose kind of settle. Maybe this is my life now. Maybe it's not going to be the same. Maybe I can't work. Maybe I can't grow. Maybe I can serve the way that I served before. So we go and settle for a life called at least. At least I can still go to church. At least I can still do this. At least this is what I can do for now and I'm good with it. But Jesus asked the blind man in Mark 8, are you good with that or you want more? You want the power of again. You want, you want to see clearly, not settle for trees. And there's a lot of us, we choose to settle for trees. Jesus asked him to give him an opportunity. Are you good with that? Or you want to be restored again and if God can give you something you never had he has the power to restore something you've lost and I don't know what you lost I don't know what what you've lost in your life I don't know what's something that was there but then it feels like I'm, I'm just trying to live with this and, and sometimes we choose to settle but I'm here to encourage you today whether you keep believing on that thing that you never experienced before, but then God says, hey, you can perceive me. If you perceive me as a God that could do the impossible, then you will experience the supernatural. Or you can, experience, you can perceive me as a God that restores. I can still restore you. It's not too late. You're not that old. I'm not done when I say it's over. It's not finished for you. God can still restore you back. And when God restores, he restores better than what you've lost. I'm here to tell you, whatever the enemy took whatever sickness took whatever if that peace was gone God can restore you that so he touched him again and he saw I want to ask the worship team to come and I want to give you an opportunity to respond today what are you believing God for that you never experienced or what was something that you lost that you're believing for a restoration. Sometimes we're holding on to a word, we're excited as we receive a word, but then suddenly as time keeps going and, and, and the delay and the waiting is tough and it's difficult, we begin to lose hope. We begin to lose that hope. We begin to forget that the word of God will never come back to him void or empty, but it will always accomplish its purpose. What did you lose today? child of God what was something that you had but it's gone what what is something that, that that used to work and it's no longer there I don't know what it was or maybe what is what maybe there's some dreams here that 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 you 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 had a dream before to build something maybe it's a business maybe it's an idea maybe it's your family but then that dream is dead and I'm here to tell you that you can dream again because as I close, I remember a story of another blind man named Bartimaeus. He was sitting at the roadside. He was begging and his posture kind of speaks and reveals to us that he had already lost hope. He lost hope. But then Jesus was passing by. Listen, if you, you're, maybe you're like Bartimaeus, you've given up. You're just seated by the roadside. That's your posture today. I don't know if something good can happen. I'm not sure. I've tried. I've prayed many times, but it's not working. But I want to let you know your very hope is right here. The same Jesus is right here, passing by. And then suddenly Bartimaeus got up and he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And sometimes the thing is we begin to have a desire, but we have oppositions. And just because we're stopped, we also quit. What's crazy about the story is that the people that were with Jesus try to silence him. It's sometimes it's not supposed to happen, but sometimes 
the people that's supposed to lift us up are the people that's trying to silence us. But I love Bartimaeus because if he had that desire, faith was birthed in his heart. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He said, quiet, Bartimaeus. And he said, crowd out all the more. The more he was stopped, the more he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. His very statement speaks of a revelation and a perception that Bartimaeus perceived Jesus not just as an ordinary human being or a carpenter's son. He said, son of David, a title given to the Messiah. While people were waiting on Jesus, the Messiah, they were blind. But a blind man gets to see and hear that Jesus was there. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, Jesus. Well, he kind of heard and he stopped. And he goes to Bartimaeus, what do you want? Isn't it obvious, Jesus, I, I can't see? Now, what do you want? Sometimes we, we're used to just have things in our heart. We don't, we don't, we forgot the power of speaking it. Today, what do you want? What if Jesus is right here? And he is here. The presence of God is right here. What do you want? How would you ask God? What is something that you need? Is it something that you're believing for that never happened in your life ever since? Maybe you never had a perfect home. Maybe you, maybe you never had financial breakthrough. Maybe, I don't know. But what is it that you want? Can we all stand today? Maybe it's something that you lost. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today. I want to see. And I want to let you know the same Jesus is right here. And if you could only perceive, what do you want? What are some things that you lost along the way and you tried to settle? You tried, maybe this is it. I feel like there are people that used to serve before and you lost that. God's not angry at you. I believe there are people today, God wants you to come back and not just go to church, but be involved. Be part of the house. You're not an outsider. You come back home like the prodigal and just come back. I feel like there are people today, God has been challenging you to get involved again, but you lost that passion. But today, what can God restore? What do you want? Just very quick. We don't need to be in a hurry, but at the same time, not to take so much time. If that's you, can you come here to the altar? Can you, we want to pray for you. There are leaders that are here. They're going to pray for you. If you're believing God for something and you feel like we never had this before, I'm not sure if this can happen. Or I lost this thing and I need restoration. If that's you, can you raise your hand? One, two, three, just raise your hand. Just very quick, can you just come? That's your first step. That's your, like, Jesus, I want to see. Come forward. One, two, three, just come. And just receive, yeah, come, come. And receive ministry real quick. Wow. God wants to encounter you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Worship team, you just lead us into worship today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Oh, Yarabasan de Te Parasuko Yarabas. Yarababasan. Come on, he's here. Wow. Some of you you're crowding over there. The people leaders that are here today. It's a lot of people that are there. Come on, just lift up the name of Jesus.
Fill me up again, Lord, today. Cause all you are is all you are. Is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Say, not for a minute. Not for a minute. Was I forsaken? The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. 